Good morning, Sona. Morning. Good morning, Ilya. Um, so what I wanted to do is briefly give an overview of the program and a little introduction as to the different elements of the program that we hope will work together seamlessly. And so I'll uh, briefly introduce, uh, again, the program is called Genomics in the Virtual Lab. Uh, we'll have a number of speakers throughout the program, but because this is our first time meeting, I wanted to make sure that everybody understands how the different elements are going to work together. So first of all, about myself, uh, I work with a company called Pine Biotech, and uh, we actually uh, develop a lot of educational resources and uh, technology and solutions for both research and education. And we have uh, the privilege of working with a number of collaborators in different university labs that um, uh, that are specialized in a lot of different types of omics data. And uh, m our goal as a company is to really make bioinformatics more accessible to a wider uh, number of uh, users. That includes biologists, clinicians, students, people that are just getting interested in bioinformatics that are maybe thinking about what degrees they will pursue in their future careers. And so we try to make sure that the bioinformatics methods and logic is clear and understandable and uh, it can be effective in the hands of those that are uh, interested uh, and pursuing a research question. So we have um, developed a number of these resources and some of them we'll be using throughout this uh, program, this course. Uh, we'll also uh, continue to develop these kinds of materials. They include tutorials, they include some uh, software solutions, uh, but also uh, they include these kinds of programs. So this is just one of the programs that we run. We have a number of other ones, and some of you might have been a part of these previous programs or might have been exposed to some of the materials about these programs. So by participating in this program today, you'll have a chance to kind of see what these programs are and what do they um, give you at the end of the program uh, course. So this program is going to be looking at a variety of different types of uh, omics data. Uh, we'll talk a lot about the relationship between the sequence and the structure, and we'll talk about the relationship between biology and data. We'll look at how these complex biological processes could be studied by looking at data. And of course, when it comes to data, there are a number of different types of omics data. We'll cover that a lot more in detail, but a lot of these uh, sequencing techniques and, uh, uh, and techniques to generate the data allow us to study at a very um, a detailed level what goes on inside cell, the cell. And uh, surprisingly, by looking at what goes on inside the cell, we can actually solve uh, challenges and problems that are typical in biomedical research, including a number of different clinical as well as pharmaceutical uh, and biotechnology challenges. So those of you that are interested in biomedical research and are thinking about clinical applications of bioinformatics, as well as applications of bioinformatics in pharmaceutical companies and biotechnology companies. Uh, we believe that the materials that you'll be exposed to in this program will help you understand how data uh, is becoming a major focus for a lot of these applications. And hopefully you'll get a chance to apply some of these tools uh, with your own hands. Uh, develop some research questions about uh, important diseases and conditions, um, and also see how to um, actually answer those questions with some of these tools. So I also want to introduce you to Dr. Sona Vasudevan. She is a program director and professor of biochemistry at Georgetown University Medical Center. Um, and she has uh, a lot of experience both in teaching and in research. I um, want to um, give over uh, the microphone to her to briefly maybe introduce herself in a few words, and then I'll do a little program overview after this, so if that's okay with you. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you, Ilya. Hello, everyone. I'm extremely excited, um, um, and I hope uh, you all enjoy the two weeks. Uh, we will try to do our best uh, to keep you engaged. 
Um, uh, my background is actually physics. I'm a physicist by training. Um, and then I switched to applications of uh, you know, physics into the field of bioinformatics and biology. Um, and I run a master's program, uh, which is a master's program in systems medicine. Um, so teaching is my passion. And uh, you know, I've been doing this for um, over 10 years. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to the week with you all. Um, and uh, let's uh, have a fruitful, effective, interactive session uh, this week. Over Excellent. to you. Thank you very much, yeah. Sona. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure for us to have you here. And we all hope to learn from you because you do have a lot of experience. So yeah. let's uh, go over some of the uh, program materials and talk about what we will cover in two weeks uh, that uh, we'll meet every day uh, for a couple of hours. Um, so this program is called Genomics in the Virtual Lab. And uh, we have organized the materials so that we first cover a number of bioinformatics tools and data sets that we will cover. And then we'll transition to focus on genomics and biomedical research. Uh, so in the first week, uh, we'll talk about introduction to bioinformatics, discuss protein structure and function, look at multiple sequence alignment and phylogeny, and look at mutations in 3D structures of proteins, how those mutations could be mapped onto these 3D structures. And we'll also have a guest lecture and have some weekend activities for you. Then in week two, we'll talk about how to do research literature review and design your project. Uh, we'll talk about genomics and application to virology and infectious diseases, look at microbial communities and antibodies and how we can study the microbiome, and also discuss antiviral drugs, vaccines, and antibiotics. And we hope that as a result of these two weeks, each one of you will be able to come out with some kind of a mini project presentation. We'll talk about such diseases as sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis and others. And so we hope that as a result of using a number of the tools that we've prepared uh, little tutorials and examples with, uh, you'll be able to appreciate the relationship between sequence and function, and uh, we'll be able to answer any questions that you might have as you start developing your research projects. Now, I do wanna mention that we have a chat and um, in this chat, you'll be able to ask questions. So what we'll do is we'll review the program uh, coursework, which, is, uh, which are the sessions that I've described now. Then we'll talk about uh, some facilitating kind of infrastructural things that will help us track everybody's progress and help you make uh, the most out of your time. Uh, but during this whole time, please feel free to ask any questions in the chat. Uh, we have a number of people that are going to be supporting this program. So Sona will be doing uh, most of the teaching in the first part of the program. Uh, we'll have a number of guest speakers and other trainers. But as in any session, you can uh, actually ask questions in the chat and we'll address those. Uh, we have specific uh, time points where we'll stop and kind of answer those questions. Okay, so um, in week one, we'll talk about bioinformatics tools and uh, the data sets. Uh, so a big part of bioinformatics is organizing those data sets and making them accessible. And different, num uh, different tools are designed for different types of analyses. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, our platform that will allow you to do big data processing. And we'll talk about different visualization tools and tools that will allow you to compare different sequences. And we'll also introduce you to a number of resources where you can uh, spend time independently of the sessions that we have and uh, learn more about some of these tools and methods of analysis. So we'll talk about introduction to bioinformatics and the different omics technologies, uh, the problem of big data and biomedicine and research. And we hope that as a result of this first session, you'll get an overview of databases and resources that are available to carry out data-driven research in life sciences. We'll talk then about protein structure and function because the sequences that we analyze end up being functional um, proteins and it's important to understand the relationship between the DNA sequence and the protein structure. 
And then we'll talk about how to analyze the sequences in both nucleotide and amino acid uh, form and to understand what are the important differences for us to focus on and how phylogenetic relationship could be inferred from multiple sequence alignment. Then we'll talk about how mutations or individual changes in the sequences could be mapped onto the 3D structures of proteins. And so we'll learn about tools like PyMol and Chimera to discuss how we can visualize and find specific points in the proteins. And then we'll talk about how we can actually find interesting data sets and take those data from different publicly available uh, repositories. Now, in view of our weekend uh, that's going to come after this session, we'll do a little review um, and we'll have a guest lecturer to talk about uh, the protein data bank. Uh, and we'll also have some interactive activities and weekend activities for you um, for that weekend. Um, so we'll uh, discuss those in detail um, at a later time, but um, in the second part of the program, we'll actually start talking about genomics in research uh, in application to uh, basic and translational research. Uh, and we'll talk about how you can make the most out of this program to prepare a project of your own. So we'll actually talk about literature review and designing your project. We'll give you some examples of projects that have been developed by us as examples specifically for teaching, but also some student example projects that you can see um, and uh, evaluate for um, what you might be interested in. We'll talk about genomics and virology. One of the major um, uh, aspects of uh, kind of outcomes of this genomic revolution has been our ability to understand the world of viruses and microbes and really see them in, uh, you know, detect them and categorize them and characterize them. Uh, we'll talk about the microbiome and different types of uh, microbiome studies that are allowed by what's called 16S ribosomal RNA amplicon sequencing. Uh, we'll talk about vaccines, antibiotics, and antiviral drugs. Uh, and we'll use the NCBI virus project, which is a new uh, project by the National Center for Biotechnology Information that was recently released where you can uh, find a lot of information on different types of viral genomes and uh, other data sets about viruses. For the weekend, uh, we'll hope that by that time, each one will have um, a project presentation prepared throughout the, those two weeks. And we will talk about how uh, to improve those and make them ready for a presentation. And then we'll have a panel of judges that are experts in different bioinformatics uh, fields that will give you personal feedback on the projects that you develop. And um, at this time, we hope that you will be able to apply some of the tools that we've discussed to some of the data sets that we will introduce you to, uh, do literature review, do your own analysis or maybe work in groups together with someone else, develop a research project and a presentation and record it so that it could be reviewed by this panel of judges. Are there any questions about any of these sessions that we are planning for? Again, if you have any questions, you're welcome to put those in chat. Or um, as we go along, you can also think of other questions that you might have. I will show you now where you can find a detailed syllabus and how to complete your registration if you have not completed it yet. So I know that some of you here are already registered. Some of you might have been interested in but have not had time to complete the registration. So let me introduce you to some of those important links where you will find all of this information. So the way the program registration happens is, um, and yes, there is a certificate for this course as well. Uh, so, uh, and I'll show you in a little bit how to get the most out of this program. So there's a link for pre-registration where you will find a form to fill up. And in this form, uh, we will be asking you questions about your background and about your interests. And uh, the objective of that is to really make sure that the program is a good fit for you. After you uh, fill out this information, you will get an email 
about all of the program details, including the registration link. And in that registration link, you can actually complete your registration. Now, in this registration link, you will be introduced to our Science Coach Training Portal. So the Science Coach Training Portal will provide you with a lot of resources that we'll be referring to throughout this program, and you'll be able to see your progress as you go through some of the materials that we have. So let's briefly take a look at this site. Okay, so here's the site. You will have to register on the site. The registration itself is actually free, but you end up with a profile. And so once you are registered and logged in, you will see your name pop up right here. And then you can go to programs. And this is the program that we are in, is genomics in the virtual lab. So if you go to programs and find genomics in the virtual lab. So once you get there, it looks like this. You will start seeing here uh, updates from people that have joined the program. And you'll see a number of additional program resources right here in the secondary menu. For example, we will have a forum where you can post any questions and we will have discussions about some of the technical methods or links to different data sets that we do, or maybe a detailed explanation on how to install a particular piece of software that we're gonna be using. You will also see a number of courses. These are going to be asynchronous self-paced courses that you can complete. And for each one of those courses, you will get a certificate of completion with your name on it. Some of those will include practical assignments. Then we will have a number of project examples for you to review. There will be a progress tab where you can actually look at where the whole group is in terms of their progress of completing the different materials that we have. And you will also see a syllabus right here. For some of you, you know, if your screen is not wide enough, you will have to click on the menu and click on the syllabus. So this syllabus includes a detailed overview of these sessions that we have discussed and what will be covered in each session. For some of these sessions, you will also see an additional resource, which, is, which could be a course or a project. Uh, a project would be a data set that we'll be reviewing with an associated publication. So that's um, a little bit about the program. Again, to join the program, you have to create a uh, profile, a user profile. And this user profile is a centralized place for you to track all of your activity. So let me briefly tell you about some of the coursework that you will be able to access during the course of this program. We have a variety of courses, uh, starting from introduction to bioinformatics to an overview of genomics, transcriptomics, epigenomics, metagenomics, and an introduction to machine learning for biomedical data. All of these are around your own individual profile. In that profile, you will see points accumulating as you go through some of the course material, and you will see your progress and completion of courses for which you will get a certificate of completion. In these courses, you will find a number of resources that are timed. So again, you can go through and see how much time will be required to complete each lesson. There are um, uh, terms that are explained if uh, you're not familiar with the terminology of bioinformatics or even molecular biology, we try to make sure that those are explained uh, uh, well. You'll see here on top a number of additional tools for you to use. For example, you can download a course outline, you can download the, the PDF materials, uh, you can also see a lesson forum where you can ask questions and get clarification on any issues or questions that you might have. Um, and so this is a resource, an additional resource that you will get access to apart from just the sessions on Zoom like today. Okay, so some questions here. I'm a beginner. How would I derive maximum benefit from this program? I don't mind fast track reading. So we'll talk about the you know, objective of the program is to really uh, give you an introduction and also give you some hands-on practice. So if you are participating in the sessions 
And if you go through the um, additional materials that we ask you to um, look at throughout the program, uh, you will need at least three to four hours a day um, to really get the most out of this program because we will meet for two hours every day in sessions like these. Uh, potentially, if you have any questions or if you have any uh, challenges with downloading software or maybe preparing for an assignment, you know, that will require a little bit more time. So it doesn't have to be four hours at, you know, in one chunk. You can join the session and then take a break and then come back and, and do some more time. Okay, um, other questions here? Um, okay, thank you. Sona and Beeps are answering some of those. Okay, so let me complete some of these additional uh, logistical slides. So again, your profile is also something that is an outcome for you as you complete some of these resources and materials. So we will look at how um, you uh, complete some of these courses. We have a number of exercises that are graded some of the exercises are going to be for you to practice. Some of them are going to be to earn points. And as those points accumulate, we will actually introduce you to our leaderboard. On this leaderboard, we highlight and feature the most active students that have the most points throughout the um, program that we will do. We'll also give you access to our cloud-based T-BioInfo platform. On this platform, you will have a number of tools that you'll get access to that do not require you to be familiar with bioinformatics or know how to code. So the important benefit of this platform is that you will be able to process large data sets and apply complex methods without the need of coding. In the platform, you will build pipelines. These bioinformatics pipelines allow you to understand the logic of analysis. They are color coded, so you understand why each button, uh, what kind of function it performs. There are explained methods that you can click a link and read more about. It deals with a variety of input and output formats and also provides some guidance so that you don't have to make any major mistakes as you go through some of those steps. Some of those will be available as practical assignments that you can do in R and Python. So again, this is going to be more for the second part of the program when we deal with um, some of those examples that were described in week two. But you will be able to practice some of the materials in R and Python if that is something that you would like to do. So there we will provide you with some code. You will be able to run that code and modify it to really understand what kinds of data sets you can analyze with these methods and what do they perform? What kind of function do they perform? Again, all of these are graded and you will get points for completing specific assignments. For this first week, we will focus on PIMO. So we do ask you that you already start preparing for the program, download, uh, download the uh, PIMO software on your computer and uh, Dr. Vasudevan will be going through how to start applying it to different uh, types of data. In the second part of the program, we will also touch on uh, Chimera, which is another similar software tool that is commonly used in a lot of research studies for visualization and some analysis. Okay, I do want to mention that there is a number of additional people that have contributed to making these uh, uh, programs possible. Dr. Alfred Tauber and Dr. Leonid Brodsky um, are the founders of uh, Pine Biotech and they also are uh, the major leaders at the Tauber Bioinformatics Research Center, which is a research center at University of Haifa. In addition to their guidance, we have a number of team members that have been preparing the platform and the coursework, and we'll be supporting your activity throughout this program, answering your questions, sending out emails, making sure that you know where to find what. So I do want to focus on uh, Beepsa, who is our community manager, and you'll be getting a lot of emails from her. So please do uh, keep those emails in a separate inbox. If you have any questions about Zoom links, or where to find a specific course that we are covering, et cetera, you'll be able to reach out to her and she will help you find them. 
Yes, and Bipsa also uh, put in the chat there, so you can add her email, marketing at pine.bio, to your contact so you don't lose any of those emails. Okay, so uh, any questions re related to PyMall and what we will be doing, I will let uh, Dr. Sona Vasudevan answer those. So uh, unless you have any other questions, I will transfer it over to her so that she can guide us through um, what she has planned for this session. Thank you, Ilya. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay. So uh, thank you, Ilya. So Ilya took away some of the part that I wanted to talk about uh, in terms of explaining what the first week will look like. So um, th since he has already done that, I'm just going to go and switch uh, gears to get started. Already, so uh, the way I like to work is uh, I would love to have an interactive session. Um, and so as and when you have a question, um, I know Bipsha is actually monitoring the chat and I can look uh, at once in a while as well. Or I'm not sure if you're allowed to unmute and ask the question. So the goal is today, um, it's just to have an introduction. So it's completely an introductory lecture. Um, so for those who are very, very new to the whole field of bioinformatics, so there is no complicated um, tools or resources we are going to be do doing today. This is just an introduction. Um, and let's see how interactive we can get. Uh, so I'm going to begin. Okay. So this is something that I wanted to um, talk to you about, but since Ilya has already told you what we're going to do, um, I'm just going to skip uh, this slide. Um, but today, what I'm going to do is um, you will learn by the end of the day, you should learn what bioinformatics actually means. Uh, if you Google a bioinformatics, you're going to get millions and millions of records in Google, which means it's an important term to know. Um, and this is a definition that I have come up with, and this is a definition I hope will make sense to everyone. And we're all talking about big data, big data, big data. So what I'm going to talk to you about, what are the challenges we are facing today because of the big data? And also, where is all this big data actually coming from? Uh, that Ilya was talking to you about mm -hmm. all different research projects that we can do and how can we look at diseases. Uh, so I'm going to introduce you to all the, where the data is actually coming from and what it means and how we can actually use. So, so today we're just gonna get introduced to the big data, uh, where all this data is coming from. And because of all of this big data, we have given birth to a whole new field of genomics, right? So that is what we're gonna be focusing on today. So now before we define what bioinformatics is, I wanna to talk to you about what is informatics? So uh, if you want to take a stab at what informatics is, you can start uh, typing in the chat. Um, and I'm gonna wait for like 10 seconds to see if anyone has a definition of what informatics actually means to you. I'm just watching, it's gathering on organization information, fantastic. So that's precisely it actually. Betsy, you have given the real definition. So study of how information is collected, stored, manipulated, classified, organized, retrieved, visualized, it's all too complex, right? So, and how close, how does it differ from information technology, IT, right? We all hear about IT, IT experts. So how does informatics actually differ from information technology, information science, computer science, so all of them are all pretty much belong to the same family, right? So it's all about data and how you collect data. What kind of data you collect is immaterial, right? So you go shopping mm -hmm. and all your, uh, you know, the shoppers and everything, they're collecting data as well. So pretty much we're breathing in and breathing out data today, right? So for example, we are in the middle of a pandemic, right? COVID-19. How many publications do you think that we have actually had on COVID-19 in the last six months? Any guesses? How many, pub how many published papers are out there? That's data, right? So what do you all think? How, how many papers do you think we have right now on COVID-19 in the last six months since we started getting into this pandemic? Any guesses? 1,000, 30? 
it's actually 30,000. So you can see the entire world is working. So that's data, right? So that's what Risa, um, Ilya was talking about research. How do you review literature? So there are like 30,000 publications. So you can see every second we are generating data. Now, importance to everyday life. Can we live without informatics today, right? Uh, my personal view is we cannot. Everything is about data. Anything you do is data. So I don't think we can live without informatics today, right? Absolutely not. So every day we are touched influenced by informatics. So I'm sure that you all have a Facebook account, a Twitter account. These are all one of the most famous. In fact, this was actually created by a high school student. Uh, so we are all looking at data all over the place, right? So there is scientific data as well coming out of all of this. Now, so we are actually living in a data-centric world. And we are also, we have lots of devices, accusation devices to collect this data. And every single one of us is actually creating content, creating data. And the biggest challenge is how can we actually meaningfully use this data to get information from this, get the information and how do we actually convert this to meaningful knowledge? And how can we use this data to uh, use as key to advances in sciences in different disciplines? How are we going to use this data, right? So of course, we are gonna be focused on biological data, right? So no escape now, all of us need to learn how to deal with data. And data keeps coming and all of these different tools and there's lots of different disciplines that we, and we need all of you to collect, the, collect and uh, disseminate and actually analyze this data. So the whole goal uh, is for us to take this data, get relevant information from it and transform that information to knowledge. From knowledge, then we can actually see how best to use the data and go to the next step, right? Now you all would have actually realized a lot of different omics, right? So there are different uh, types of omics that's there. And I'm just going to put bioinformatics in the perspective in this whole world of informatics. So American Medical Informatics Association has actually come up with all of these different omics. And we need all of these omics. We need a collaboration between data from all of these different omics. And we have each one is trying to give us different levels, right? So we have biomedical informatics, we have health informatics, uh, we have imaging informatics, we have clinical informatics, we have public health informatics. So each one is dealing with different aspects, right? So imaging is based on, you know, it's tissues and organs, and then individual patients is clinical informatics because you gather data from patients. You then you have population society, society and then which is public health, which is all, all of us are doing you know, part of the public health informatics. So, but what we are going to focus on is just one small iota of this whole world of informatics, which is bioinformatics, which is deals with molecular processes, uh, proteins, uh, DNA, RNA, and all of those things, right? So that's what we're going to focus on. Now, what is bioinformatics, right? Each one of us can come up with a definition. This is like a 50 year old definition. It is pretty much information you have a mouse and you apply it to biology. And so you just bioinformatics. It's about computer and mouse. This was a traditional definition that was used about 20 years ago, right? But now National Institutes of Health has come up with a definition, which is all very, very wordy, right? At the end of the day, it's about data, how you acquire the data, how you store this data, how you organize, archive, analyze, and visualize. This is just too complicated for me, right? This is just a big, if you were to write an exam to memorize such a big definition of bioinformatics is just a lot. But I'm gonna, in the next uh, several slides, we are gonna come up with what actually is bioinformatics and this will tie to everything Ilya was talking about, the whole proteomics uh, and all the different omics terms, right? So this is biological data, how do you do, um, experimentation in the computer. That's why this is called genomics, in virtual genomics, which means we are doing all the experimentations within a computer, right? So computer calculations and what comes out of all of these things. Now there are lots of subdisciplines within bioinformatics because bioinformatics is an interdisciplinary field because we need computer scientists, we need biologists, 
We need even economic uh, economists right now, right? So we need, it's an interdisciplinary field. So there is a development of new algorithms and you have statistics because the minute you talk about big data, you need statistics because you want to see if this one single mutation is actually statistically significant for us to say, yes, this particular mutation causes that particular disease, right? And then we have an analysis and interpretation of various types of data, including nucleotides, amino acid mm -hmm. sequences, protein domains, and protein structures, and how do we get structures to function, and all of those things. And then the development and implementation of tools, because we can have, we can generate data. We can have computer scientists to develop tools to look at the data. And we also need, without tools, we cannot even mine and look at this data. That's what this course, you're gonna be learning about a lot of resources where there is data, but also you're gonna be using tools to be able to use, how do you use the data without tools, right? But we are going to be focusing just on this aspect of nucleotides, amino acid structures, and all of that for the first one week, right? Now, is informatics a new field? What do you think? I really love to ask this question to all my students and I get different kinds of answers. So I would like to know, of course, I wish I had some polling uh, set up so that we could have just polled. Now, what do you all think? Is bioinformatics a new field or not? You can just type yes or no answer into the chat and we'll see, we'll just wait for a second and see. Okay, no, bioinformatics is not a, or is not a new field. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of new, no, 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 no. That is actually, no, okay. So bioinformatics is actually, you're right, is not a new field, right? So um, where do you think it was born? So bioinformatics is not a new field, um, but where was bioinformatics actually born? Who gave to this whole field of bioinformatics? Any guesses of which continent? When I went to school, it was seven continents. I don't know how many continents we have today. Uh, but how did Rosalind, uh, so you mean Rosalind Franklin. Okay, who, who, where was it born? Which continent was it born, you think? Any guesses of where bioinformatics was actually born? Asia, okay, that would be my guess as well. Um, X-ray crystallography, chromatography of DNA, USA, okay, probably in Europe, okay, so we're covering a lot of different continents here, we've covered Asia, you've covered Europe, uh, Asia is coming up a lot, Europe is coming up a lot, um, UK, yeah, sure, okay, so Cuba, okay, good guess. Actually, I'm going to take uh, someone who just actually uh, maybe one who made the protein atlas. Okay, we are actually coming really, really close. That is very true. So bioinformatics has actually, I spent a lot of time on the slide just because it's really fun to see how people think, right? Where it was born. Um, and um, yes, it was actually, I'm gonna get closer to, uh, I think it was Parimala um, or someone else said who, uh, USA, right? So I think whoever said USA, it is actually correct. So it was actually born in the U US. And uh, it was actually, I'm very proud to say that it, it was actually born in the universities I work in, at Georgetown University. And I think Parimala, you are actually right. It was actually the person who actually made the protein atlas. And who is that person who made the protein atlas? Any guesses? So uh, before I introduce, um, I have to give tribute to this person, Robert Ledley. Um, he was a faculty at Georgetown. He actually died uh, from Alzheimer's disease. Um, and he was the person who actually discovered a whole body CT scanner as well. And he actually published a paper in 1959 where he said, uh, he predicted that 50 years or 30, 40 years from when he wrote that paper, that we are going to be drowned in data and we are going to be dealing with biological data. He is the person who actually hired the person to Georgetown, who actually gave birth to the entire field of bioinformatics. And she is actually officially now called the father and the mother of bioinformatics. She was declared the father and mother, mother of bioinformatics by David Lipman, who actually was the director of uh, NCBI, which we will talk about. So yes, those of you who said it's a lady, yes, it is a lady. And she was the one, and she actually came up with this atlas of protein sequence and structures. It was actually before my time as well in 1965, right? So this is 
So in 1965, I don't even know how many years ago that was, um, where people used to actually get sequences published in a book. People used to sequence and send the sequence to Margaret Dayhoff. And she used to just publish this in a book. And this book was the one that was actually uh, posted to all the scientists around the world. And that is how they used to get the protein sequences, right? So now, what were are her other seminal contributions? Yes, someone said, I think it was uh, Parimala who said, protein atlas, and what, and she gave birth. At that point, she was a visionary. She's considered a visionary because people who are visionaries, they already think what's coming 50 years down the road. She was the one who said, well, we are gonna have a data explosion. So let's create what is called a database. So she was the person who first created the protein database. And if any of you are visiting Washington DC sometime and you visit Georgetown, I can take you to actually the servers and all the books that she published, we still have it because you know I used to hate history uh, in school, but now I love history. And so I have actually kept all her papers and everything else as everything was coming along. And she also came up with a single letter code for amino acids. I'm sure you all know what single letter amino is, acid letter code is, right? I'm sure. I don't want to quiz you on that. But is there any reason do you think that she came up with a single letter amino acid code? For example, glycine, GLY is G, right? Alanine, ALA is A, right? So mm -hmm. do you know why? Yeah, efficiency. But other than the efficiency, of course, it's very efficient, right? Today we look at it and it's extremely efficient. But think in 1960s, why would she come up with a single letter amino acid letter code? What do you all think? Easier representation? Yes, that is definitely true. But other than that, you know, you all are in a generation where we have gigabytes of data in your phone. You're carrying gigabytes of data in your cell phone. So you can do this whole thing in a cell phone, right? Back then, yeah, it was lack of computation power. Back then they were talking about kilobytes of data or even megabytes of data. So they did not have in the supercomputers. So they wanted to make sure that they don't have enough space. So they had to actually convert that to single letter amino acid code. In fact, I learned all these stories from people who worked with her who are actually still at church now, right? Coding, storing information is efficient. That is correct. So now from that, where did we head, right? 1950s. And of course, you all know about Watson and Crick, right? Without Watson and Crick, we won't be here today. And then we have Sanger sequencing. Without sequencer, we could not have sequenced anything, right? So insulin was the first protein. And then, of course, things started evolving. We started seeing a lot and lot more. <coughs> Excuse me. We started seeing, and then we started seeing polymerase chain reaction. And then, <clears throat> and then we started seeing uh, NCBI, and then we started seeing all of these different databases. And it was in 1991, the official term bioinformatics was coined and it came up in the literature. <coughs> Excuse me, I think I'm screaming a lot here with out of excitement uh, because of all of you, right? So then we started seeing all of these tools that was developed and all of those things. And then we started developing and a lot, a lot of different things started. And you can actually pay attention to here where the whole genome project initiative was actually started in the 80s. Me. And then, um, and then the origin of bioinformatics, the first protein sequence reported was that of insulin, 1956. It consisted of only one, uh, 51 amino acids. And then nearly a decade later, the first nucleic acid sequence was reported. Again, there is a faculty at Georgetown who, we, uh, who actually passed away two years ago, Jack Shuriken. Mm -hmm. He was the first person to actually sequence a tRNA um, when he was at Princeton. So, and then what happened was a major event happened that was, that changed the whole course of human history. Um, oh, I'm, did, um, are you all able to see the presentation? Yes, uh, Dr. Sona, we are able to see it. Oh, okay, because I just see that there are, is someone, someone in the chat just said yeah. that they cannot see. You could try joining in again, leaving and joining back. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so a major event that actually happened, right? That actually changed the whole, whole, the whole course of human history. And do you all know what that is? Do you all know what that was? That suddenly this, there was a big event that happened that actually changed the whole course. And now we are all, yes, that was correct, Betsy. It is a human genome project, right? 
It was a joint British and American and, um, effort. It was a race who will complete first. It was a race test, not whether they have to take drugs, but whether they can actually produce them. And it was all the human genome project was sequenced, right? So our life for actually. And so, and then the, it was a beginning of data explosion, right? So for detailed history, you can actually go here. Uh, those of you who are very interested, go here. So what happened was this ended up to be the biggest breakthrough mm -hmm. in the field of informatics. And that has caused the birth of many, 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 many disciplines, right? And so we are now in a whole data tsunami, right? Big data. This is where it actually started, but it did end there. We are still doing a lot of data, right? And that's why we are all in a luxurious state that you can actually do projects. You can actually discover things yourself. It may seem odd, but each one of you can actually find something new because there's so much data that we still need a lot of people to actually look at this data. So now at the conclusion of the human genome project, what happened? It actually created a whole new field of science and medicine called the genomics, right? And now uh, it is completely a whole new field of genomics, or virtual genomics, where we can actually um, Okay, right? And so um, then what happened was the human genome was sequenced and then that it didn't end there. Then people started going crazy and started sequencing more and more genomes, right? They started um, sequencing and at the end of the human genome, we had 3.2 billion base pairs of the human genome, right? And people started sequencing more and more genomes of Drosophila, rat, and chicken, and mouse, and all of those things. So when you, when you think that we are the most important uh, people on, on this planet, right? And we are all trying to solve diseases. We are all trying to cure diseases. When once the human genome, when they declared that it was sequenced, why do you think it is important to actually sequence the genomes of rats and mouse and chicken? Why do we care? Why do you think we have to sequence other genomes? Why did people do that? Uh, any ideas, any guesses? Yes, comparison, right? That's right. So you want to compare because you know what? We cannot do and to study evolution, that is perfect, and to study evolution, but you want to compare comparative genomics, right? For example, if I want to find a cure for a disease, even for COVID, lab tests, correct. So even if, for example, COVID-19, right, we are trying to create, like what, 20 different groups in the world are creating vaccines, trying to do vaccines. You cannot do all of that in humans, right, uh, to do all the testing. We have to first use what are called the model organisms. We want to test that before we actually test it in the mm -hmm. human, right? So that's why we have mouse, rats, and chickens, and everything else was sequenced so that we can do comparative genomics of what is different between humans and them for various research purposes, right? To create a, create a disease model, fantastic. So that the potential for drugs, of course, you guys are really, I love you guys. You're very, very interactive. This is what gives me more energy to shout even more, right? And so now, but what happened is because we have sequenced so many genomes now and so many, everything else, and we have so many proteomes right now, it also comes with a lot of different challenges, right? The challenges that we are actually facing today is that the number of sequences is exploding. We have 106 billion nucleotides. We have more than 6 million data from environmental sequences alone. This, we are not even, I'm not even going to talk about this unless one of you is interested. I can talk about this later. And then we have lots of uh, data in, uh, uh, in Uniprot knowledge base, which we're going to be talking about. And you will have lots of hands-on experience with Uniprot. And then from the sequences, we have domains, we have three-dimensional structures, we have protein families, we have clusters of orthologous groups, and all of those things. This is just, we are just talking about proteins and DNA. I'm not even talking about other data sources like medical, electronic health records, medical records, and any of those things. That's going to be beyond the scope for this lecture. So I'm not even going to talk about those things, right? And now, how are we going to deal with all of this data explosion, right? All of this data explosion, the first thing you want to do is collect this data and create databases so that you and me actually can get access to this data. And from that data, we can, you and me can look and search for things. We can, uh, we can see how to extract knowledge from these databases. 
and all of this that is used in genome analysis, right? So these are all the molecular biology databases. You know, I have been in the business of bioinformatics for more than 10, 15 years. One thing that's actually always been challenging to me is what is the challenge? Let me ask you the question. What do you think is the biggest challenge that we are all facing or you are facing, for example? You want to look at a protein. You want to look at something. You have a research question. What do you think is the biggest challenge that we're actually facing today? What do you think? As, as users, what are the challenges? <clears throat> Sudden change in the field extracting, yes. <clears throat> yes, all of this is correct, challenging. So all of this is correct. Storage, computational power, yes. All of these are big challenges we're facing today. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, but the biggest challenge, you know what I'm facing or I faced? I don't know where to go. I just don't know where to go. And I just don't know which database is reliable, which database is not reliable. I just don't even know where to go to get this data, right? As a new user to bioinformatics, where to find the data is actually the biggest challenge. So what happened was data managing, that is correct. So what has happened is scientists at NIH, what they did was, yes, they said, well, you know what? I want to give the community to, for them to say, okay, this database is good, this database is not good, and all of those things. So they came up with a publication, January 1st of every single year. They publish a paper, and I think I've given that paper to you, and you will receive it. And that tells you which data to, uh, which database to go to, which database is there, and how many databases are there, like, like thousands of databases right now. But you can go to that publication and look up if for protein, what are the different databases that are there that are, that are actually reliable, that are curated, which means it's actually manually someone has validated the data and all of those fun stuff, right? So this whole thing has actually given all of this data and sequencing and all of this data has actually given birth to a ohms and omic era in biology, right? So I'm sure all of you know about central dogma of molecular biology, right? I'm not going to go and talk to you about it because I'm sure all of you have heard about this or all of you have learned about this, right? So what it is is from DNA to RNA, RNA to protein, and then protein to structure, structure to function. That is pretty much the central dogma. And pretty much, of course, there was a world before the DNA took over. There was a world that was called the RNA world, which I believe in. But anyway, this is beyond the scope for this week, of course. Just wanted to put it out there, right? Now, each one of these aspects of the central dogma has created an omic term, right? So DNA, study of DNA, what is that omic term that corresponds to DNA? Anyone, any guesses? What is this called in terms of omics? If you want to convert this to omics, what is this called? What is this field of studying DNA? Genomics, fantastic. You guys are really smart. And then RNA, what is it called? Um, Transcriptomics, yes, exactly. And then proteins is proteomics, right? And then structure is something I coined myself because they didn't come up with an omic term and I'm a structural biologist by training. So I came up with structuromics and now it's beginning to actually get used in a few places. And then at the end of the day, all of us are trying to figure out the functions of each one of these, right? So then I came up to functions and then how do you understand the function? We have to look at pathways in the protein, which, which gene is implicated in which pathway and which metabolites are involved. Because at the end of the day, every cell, we look at metabolites that the, uh, that the reactions are producing. So it has created a whole field of metabolomics. So already you can see the entire central dogma is actually transformed into bio. So this is the, what I call as a dogma of bioinformatics, right? So this is all the data. And as Elia said, Pine Biotech is an outstanding platform that I've never seen any other platform that actually puts everything in one place. Pretty much you can do genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, pretty much you can do everything in one platform, right? So thanks to Elia and Pine Biotech for providing us with that, right? So then we have all of these omic terms. Of course, there are lots of, lots of uh, I mean, officially there are about more than 168 or 200 different omic terms, right? So now you can actually, what I'm trying to drive at is, this is actually explosion of data coming from each one of these particular omic terms, correct? 
And then what is missing in this list is structuromics, which I took the liberty of adding, right? So at the end of the day, each one of these omics is actually the one that is generating data, pulling us into the era of big data. And each one of this is the data that we're gonna use for research purposes to discover cure or whatever question that you may actually have, right? So this is all what we are actually looking at. Now, I gave you a formal definition of bioinformatics just about 20 minutes ago. I gave you a formal definition. But with all of this data, with all of this omic data, I came up with my own definition of bioinformatics. And I think the definition of bioinformatics is pretty much in incorporation of all of these different omic terms, right? I could only fit so many omic terms in this, but there are a lot more omic terms, right? So each one of this actually is generating data, right? So that is where all of this data from is, right? Um, how far bi bioinformatics has actually come? Bioinformatics, yes, it has actually come a very long way. So by end of this week, you're actually going to, you know, at the last lecture, who's actually actually an expert who's coming from National Center for Biotechnology Information and CBI. He actually is part of this whole data thing. So he is going to give you all the applications of bioinformatics and actually you will be actually seeing how far we have come and actually we have come a very long way, right? So I will leave it at that for now so that there is a surprise for you, right? So now bioinformatics, of course, I think we, well, I don't want to, you know, we may be running out of time, so I don't want to like spend too much time on this. So bioinformatics, anyone, any quick guesses of filling this boxes? I know this is like, you know, I wish we had uh, the Wheel of Fortune so we can actually, you know, come in intervention, information in omic term. Actually, we are very getting very, very close. Um, I'm genomics, um, somewhere there. So the terms is there, omics is there in this. And I'm just going to give you the answer. So it is actually the integration of all the omic terms, right? So that, that is my definition of bioinformatics. I'm not sure if it makes sense to you. Each of us can come up with our own definition of bioinformatics, but this is the definition of bioinformatics, right? So now what is what is all about? It's all about sequences. Why is sequence analysis very important, right? We have lots of millions and millions of sequences in public databases like NCBI, and we have a lot more in proprietary databases as well. And in locked up in all of these sequences is a huge amount of structural and function and evolutionary information which is what you're going to learn in the next few days of how are we going to get just from a single sequence how are we going to get extract the information about structures how are we going to able we are going to extract the information about functions and how are we going to look back the evolution and how is all of this relevant and how is it going to be useful today right so they are highly valuable resources right nothing in biology is without sequence analysis today right so they are high, highly valuable resources and we have huge amount of information and we are going to moving forward just focus on sequence analysis as proteins and all of those things so what is there in a sequence what we have in a sequence is actually we have it says, you know, uh, just based on alignments, we can figure out if something is conserved or not. Why is this important? I'm going to talk to you about that in, in, in the coming day or two. Why is this relevant? Why do we need alignments? What is there in a structure? So in this sequence of protein, you have all the information that you need to fold this protein and actually to figure out what regions of this protein are actually important. So in a sense, Everything that you need to know is actually hidden in this particular primary sequence, right? How are we able to get that information meaningfully to understand the functions of proteins and understand how just one single mutation in this particular sequence is actually causing a disease, right? So those are the things that we will actually be learning, right? Now, I'm just going to uh, now take you into the whole world of data, right? I'm going to tell you about all the different projects and big where it started the human genome project and where are we right now and what have we learned from each one of these projects and how can we actually use them in order to be able to move forward right so that is what we're going to learn so at the end of the day what a disease what is disease diseases are manifestation of something that's actually gone wrong in a protein or a gene right so when something goes wrong in a protein or a gene that doesn't work properly and so that manifests itself which is what we call diseases right now the pieces that are all inside of each one of us that makes who we are is we have genomes 
and we have the DNA from the genomes, and then we have the genes, and then we have the proteins, right? At the end of the day, each one of this is actually very, very important. Now, if I were to ask you a question, but I'm going to reserve it for a later time, is are you and me the same? Are you and me identical? You and me, do we have identical DNA, right? Then the problem is less complicated, right? Because all our DNA is identical, right? Is that the case? You're going to, you're going to talk about it, right? Now, the Human Genome Project, yeah, that is true. No, that's right, SNPs, absolutely. You're all getting, yes, absolutely. We are going to get to that. That's exactly what all of that you're, you're you know, putting in the chat is what we're going to be talking about in the next 30 minutes or so. The Human Genome Project has transformed the way we think about diseases, correct? So Genetics 101. So we knew about 20, 30 years ago. So DNA, this is the dogma that we just talked about, replication, then we have transcription, then we have translation into proteins, and we know proteins are the life forms, right? And we have, this is pretty much amino acids fold into three-dimensional structures, and that is where we get functions, right? And we have, we map these to pathways, then structures, genome, some, so we say from genotype to phenotype, right? So from DNA to proteins, genotype to phenotype. This is what we've learned, at least I learned in school, right? Of course, you're all learning something new. You're very lucky. I really wish I was reborn today because there's so much I can learn today that I didn't learn during my times, right? Now, how do you classify these diseases, right? So single gene disorders, so monogenic diseases, right? Sickle cell anemia. All of you heard of sickle cell anemia, I'm pretty sure, right? So monogenic diseases, this is where we knew how to deal with this for the last 20, 30 years, right? So what is monogenic? There's only a mutation in one, just one gene. So it's easy. You just fix the gene. Right now we have CRISPR-Cas9. We have everything. We have all the tools to fix this right away, right? So someone asked me earlier whether we are there yet. We are there. Almost we are able to fix these things, right? Are we able to do that? Of course, that's a complicated story. Now, complex disorders is polygenic diseases, which means there are more than one mutations, more than one polymorphisms. So it becomes very, very complex, right? Alzheimer's is a very complex disease. And then chromosomal disorders, genomic disorders, for example, Down syndrome. This is something, will, will it be possible to get these slides at the end of the class? You will get the recording of the lecture, that, as Ilya said, yes. Um, and so chromosomal disorders, genomic disorders, Down syndrome, for example, Down syndrome has is, is been there for more than 20 years. We exactly know how to detect Down syndrome when someone is pregnant during their pregnancy. We already can actually predict that they're going to have uh, you know, a child with Down syndrome. So these are all the diseases that we actually know pretty well, right? And now there are lots of other diseases, environmental infectious diseases. We are right now in the middle of a pandemic, right? COVID-19 is an infectious disease. And by now, each one of you know how complex that is, right? And it just viruses, of course. It's, it's a totally different story. And, and I am sure Ilya is going to talk about it in week two, right? And then, <clears throat> excuse me, about wholly caused by these diseases. These monogenic diseases are extra missing chromosomes. And all of these things we know very well about. And we know how to treat them. We know how to detect them. We know how to deal with all of these things, right? So these are all, of course, I wouldn't say that we have a cure for everything. We have, our, we know how to detect. These are all single mutations in the gene. And I'm going to be talking to you about sickle cell anemia tomorrow when I talk about how this one single mutation, imagine just one base change in your entire gene is changed and that is leading to a disease. Why, right? That's what we're going to talk about tomorrow, right? And then these conditions are of great importance to individuals and families that have them, but even when added together, they're rel relatively rare. And most people directly affected, uh, very, you know, only very few people are directly affected. So genetics, you know, that's played a very small role in healthcare. I'm talking about well before the whole explosion of big data. It, it played very minimal role because we knew only about a certain diseases, monogenic diseases, and all of those things, right? Now, Again, so all of these, I'm, this is just a summary. These are all the different diseases. This is monogenic diseases, right? A single mutations. And of course, for your projects that you will do, we will, you know, we will talk about some of these that you can actually pick on these diseases and look 
uh, far beyond of all of those things. Now, what happened, this was all, oh, I call it the old genetics, right? What is the new genetics? This is a result of the human genome product. It, it comes largely from the knowledge emanating from the human genome product. Right? Genetics, the future is now, right? So now, what have we learned about the human genome project? What we have actually learned is that it's complex. It has 3.2 billion base, pair, base pairs, and we also have 16,000 base pairs also in the mitochondrion. And then what happened was it, is, it was actually, as, as I said earlier, it was initiated in 1990. And then the complete draft of the human genome was actually, it came about and it was originally planned for 2005. And then they finished two years ahead of time. And the story I hear is that they ran out of money. But do we have, do we know everything we need to know about the human genome today? What is your guess? So he, I'm telling you here that the human genome is actually sequenced, which means we should know every single gene in the human body. We should know about every single gene in the human body. That means we should be solving the diseases like just like that, right? But are we? No, not at all. That is the true answer. We don't, we are still trying to understand. In fact, there, are, there is one chromosome, chromosome six, I believe, we still actually don't have the best sequence of chromosome sync. So we are still sequencing, sequencing to get a better draft. But we do, all, having said that, we still know a lot about the human genome, right? So now these are human genome projects, right? So this is a laboratory mouse. It has 20 to 21,000 genes. Look at this. Something that fascinated me was a fruit fly, right? And, uh, you know, uh, all of these things, a, a round worm, it's just a small worm that you step on as you walk. You won't even know that you step on as you walk, right? It has 13,000 genes, right? And I'm sure you all think that, and agree with me, that we are much complex than a single worm, it's a small worm, right? And, and we are complex, right? Mm -hmm. So now, what do you all think? How many genes do you think we actually have? What is your guess? Will it be A, B, C, or D? Very quick. I know that you know uh, we don't have much time to play around with it. D, okay, 10,000 genes. We have 10,000. Some people say, I wish we had polling because then we would immediately know what all of you are saying. So a lot of people are saying B, and some are saying C, some are actually saying D. Yes. <clears throat> so there is, quite honestly, there is truth to B and C. We initially thought because the worm's genome came about. It had about 13,000 genes. And just imagine a worm and a human. We thought, oh my God, we are going to have 50,000 genes. When people started sequencing the human genome in the 80s, we, the prediction was we're going to have 50,000 genes based on whatever we knew about other organisms. But now, then as we started sequencing, we said, okay, it's going to be around 35. But you know what? After sequencing, majority of you who said B are actually correct because we actually do have only anywhere between 20 to 21,000 genes. And why am I saying anywhere between 20? I'm not able to give you a full figure because we still are sequencing. Some of the chromosomes are very complex, so we are still don't know. But it, we know for a fact that we are going to have only somewhere between 20 and 21,000. That means we are not that complex, right? If you think about it, we are not that, that complex, but we are still complex. And I'll tell you where this complexity is actually coming from, right? So we have, and look at this. Human has 20,000. And we have exactly the same number of genes as a mouse. And are we the same as a mouse? A mouse is a mouse, human is a human, right? We are not. But I'm gonna tell you where this complexity of the human genome is actually coming from, right? So now, virtually all diseases except trauma actually have a genetic component, right? This is the new genetics. Now, because of all the human genome project, look at here in 2007, right after we actually saw the human, before the human genome project, we knew very little about some of the genes implicated in type two diabetes and then PPAR trauma uh, in cancers and stuff like that. And then we, we started slowly with the, uh, with the human genome. We started seeing more and more and more. And by 2007, we actually identified a lot of different genes implicated in different diseases. And we also actually, a lot more, a lot more, I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this, but I'm just fast forwarding to today. 2020, with all of the data that we have, I'm just going to rely only on Uniprod because we're gonna be doing this hands-on when we're doing the hands-on session, right? So now we, I really like this, right? So the future is now, will the really real disease gene please stand up? So we are almost there where for major, a lot of, not majority of the diseases, I will say, a lot of diseases we actually know 
uh, what are the genes that are involved in, what are the genes that are implicated in, but do we have a cure for those diseases? Of course not, right? We need your help to actually do all the projects that you have to do and then figure out, and that's where the whole world is involved in, right? To find cure for all of these diseases, but we actually at least know what is causing these diseases. That's the first step, right? So we can actually then move to the next step. So mm -hmm. now how many curated genes do you think we have identified, right? I told you that with before human genome, we just had a few genes that we knew, but now like after like 15, 17 years, what do you think? Which, how many do we actually have, right? So I don't know if people are actually typing. Yes, uh, uh, D, 2000 genes. Okay, so a majority of it, you are actually saying D. Let's see if that is the right answer. Oops, sorry. Um, maybe C, okay, we can go around. So I'm going to give you, so C and D actually are not the correct answers. So it is actually uh, B. And uh, we are going to actually, when you're doing the Uniprot hands-on, I'm going to show you where to get this number from, right? So we actually kind of, I'm going to say roughly, approximately, I should say, that we have 4,500 genes, right? We've come a long way. We've done better than you think we have done, right? Then from genes to proteins, right? So now mm -hmm. this is my last question mm -hmm. to you, right? Then we will speed up mm -hmm. and actually, you know, mm -hmm. um, try to finish. But I also want to mention that I have a whole week with you. So if I'm not able to complete something today, I will take, we'll take a tag, a tag, a tag on because we lost about first 30 minutes in the introduction today. So I'm not sure if I'll be able to complete everything that I'd planned for. Uh, so I will apologize to you ahead if you're not able to, because I like to do things slowly so that things are not speed up, but we will get, you know, we'll get to all of those. Yes, everybody has ahead of me said, fantastic. You know, I didn't even have to ask you the question. Yes, we have 100,000. So I'm sure all of you know and you have been taught that one gene codes for one protein, correct? So I told you that there are only 20,000 genes in the human. And so which means we should have only 20,000 protein products, right? Where is this 100,000? This is roughly 100,000. I should actually tell you that this is not the number. This is at least 100,000 protein products. Where do you think this is actually coming from, this number? Because I'm telling you one gene codes for one protein, but then I'm giving you this whole huge figure of protein products. Where is this? Yes, exactly. Superna Das is correct. It is alternate and Karina. Yes, it is coming from alternating splicing. And we are going to, I, I'm going to show you all of this when we do the hands-on, right? Where is this coming from? You know, we learned a lot of cool things from the Human Genome Project. We have a lot fewer, fewer genes to deal with. And only about 1.5% of the human genome is involved in coding, right? Only 1.5%, imagine, out of 100% of the human genome, only 1.5% is actually coding for proteins, right? What is the remainder of the 98.5%, right? And do you all know what that was actually called? Uh, the whole 1.98.5% of the genome that doesn't code for proteins. Do you know what that was actually called? before the whole, before 2013, I would say. I'm just going to give you the answer now. Heterochromatin, yes, someone said, Karina, you're right, junk DNA. That was what, it was all called junk. Can you believe that? It was all called junk. And now we have written a eulogy to the junk DNA, right? I'm going to tell you what that is all about. So what have we learned? We have learned that we are very different from a mouse, although we have the same number of genes with a mouse, because you know what, we have lots of, change the differences thank god we have we are different from a mouse correct so we are different but yet we do use mouse as a model because we are similar in many aspects so we are able to still use mouse and rat and chicken as models to study diseases but then some of them fail right i'm sure you've heard of lots of drugs that come to clinical trials they even come to clinical trial phase three and then they fail right because we're still trying to learn because why of course drugs why they fail, that's completely a different story. And that will take me a week to actually talk to you about drug design and everything else. That's beyond the scope of this course. And who is our closest relative? What do you think? Who is our close? Yeah, non Yeah, a lot of people. Uh, you're very interactive. I love this group. What, who's our closest relative, do you think? Apes? Primates? Monkey? Actually, chimp is our closest relative. We are actually about 96. And you know what? Some of the things that chimp has, we don't have. I wish we had what the chimp has, some of the genes that the chimp has that we don't know. And I'm thankful for some of the genes we have that the chimp doesn't have so that we're able to talk. The chimp doesn't have fox, fox P2, which is uh, for speech. I'm glad. And we have a sixth sense, you know. Um, and uh, of course, the chimp has 
some, uh, you know, some caspases that could have prevented us from getting Alzheimer's, but we have lost it. So, you know, there are good, good differences between chimp and us. <clears throat> and how close are we among ourselves? We are actually almost, but this number changes between 99.5 to 99.9. .9, but all it says is you and me, thankfully, we are all very close to each other, but we are yes, still very, very different from each other, right? So, of course, the Human Genome Project actually came up with a lot, a lot of promises. The biggest promise it came up with was we are going to solve diseases, no more diseases, end of diseases. But we are 15, 15 years after, we still have lots to learn, right? We still haven't solved a lot of diseases. We come a long way. Then, you know, the whole NIH said, you know what? We thought that, you know, um, we, with the Human Genome Project, we're able to solve all diseases. But then they realized, you know what, two people, two patients, even with it's COVID-19, right? Two people don't have the same symptoms. Some react better to some drugs than others. We still don't have a drug, but some, even some diseases in cancer, right? Some chemotherapeutic regimens work in one patient with the same disease, same cancer, same stage. It doesn't work in another. Why, right? We are similar but we are significantly different as well, right? So where is all this? So the NIH who funded the Human Genome Project and the whole world was working on it and all of those things, um, yes, all of these things. And then what happened was, what is 32 million? Okay, so what is all of these differences? Where is all of these differences coming from? When I'm telling you that we are on 99.5% similar, right? Where is all this difference? So we did not know at that point what this, so then what happened? People react different to drugs. Yes, polymorphism, wow, that is still a lot, yes. SNP, we have SNPs and all of those things, toxicity and all of those things, right? This led NIH to say, you know what? We are not, we are looking at something and we are missing a whole bunch. We are just looking at 1.5% of the genome. We're just looking at the genes, although we are 99.5% similar, but then drugs in one does not work in another, so what is happening? So then what happened was NIH said, well, let's go and look at what is that is causing that's different between us, which is the whole HapMap project, the whole mapping of polymorphism, single nucleotide polymorphism. So you can see we started here, we finished here, but we still don't have a lot of answers. We have more questions that came out of this, but not many answers. So then we said, okay, let's go and figure out the different, the 0.5% or 0.7% that is actually different between all of us, right? Now, the HapMap project, you know, so, and of course, they came up with other database generating projects, genome-wide association studies, thousand genome project, million project, and of course, go, the list goes on and on and on where we have drowning in the era of this is where all the big data, this is what is big data all about, right? So there's so much of volume of all of this data. So now what is HapMap Project? HapMap Project, <coughs> excuse me, is, is charting genetic variation between us. <coughs> excuse me, what is not what is common between you, but what is different between you and me, right? So mutation and variation, right? So th those are two different things. And I'm gonna talk to you about that tomorrow. And so we just see polymorphisms, right? So, and how can HapMap Project help us understand diseases? And why some respond and others do not respond to the same therapy, right? So this is because of human diversity. How would you test the human diversity? A single nucleotide polymorphisms. Look, look for correlation between SNPs and some of those phenotypes. So what are SNPs? SNPs are defined as single base change in your DNA, just one change, right? How scary can it be? We are sequencing, sequencing, right? And we are looking for just one small base change. So how can you say whether something is actually an error in sequencing and you find a difference, right? And then you say, oh my God, this is different. And can you say that, yes, this is different and they can have a disease? No, that's why, of course, all Ilias courses, when you take, you will see you know, all these reads and how many times we have to sequence and, we have to look at the depth, then you have to look, do all of those things, right? So we are, thankfully, we have our own ways of figuring out if that SNP is actually real, trustable, and what population actually has that SNP, right? So now the facts about SNPs are they're very common in human population. Between any two people, there's an average of one SNP in every thousand bases. And just imagine if every single difference in a SNP is going to cause a disease, 
each one of us is going to be walking around with thousands of different diseases, right? But that's not the case. We're all healthy, right? So which means majority of these SNPs that actually don't do anything, they don't cause, but there are some SNPs that actually cause a disease, which means if this, this SNP is actually, so happens to be close to a gene that is important in regulation, or if this SNP is as in a place where it changes the amino as in the coding region of the genome, then it is not going to be tolerated, right? So we are going to be talking about some of those. Then the importance of these SNPs is alleles of health-related genes. They are used as genetic markers right now. They're fast to get these genotyping. That's what it's called. And then it's genetic association studies so that one population of people may actually have some SNPs. One population may have different SNPs, right? So those are the differences between ethnic populations. So as you can see, the complexity is going more and more. Why one drug works in one person, one drug does not work in another person. Why this drug given to an Asian works differently from a, you know, a population, Hispanics or Caucasians. So you can see this is where the answer lies and we are trying to unlock this answer, right? Now, a map of the thing, just imagine it has given rise to 1.42 million polymorphisms, right? This app map. So you can already imagine how many databases are created just with this gist and how many people in the world can actually work with just this SNP data. I actually work with SNP data, right? To figure out the differences. Even with COVID, people are trying to figure out why some Asians are not having, uh, you know, symptoms and why, you know, all of those different things. Polymorphisms, why some people are having higher mortality, how some people are having more severe disease. Uh, so my guess is they probably have polymorphisms in the ACE2 and other genes that is giving them, right? I'm actually looking at those. I don't have answers, but we're all looking at these things. Now, say SNP, SNPs can lead to altered protein sequence. And so when a SNP actually changes the underlying amino acid, then it can actually cause a disease, right? So sickle cell mutations also are actually deleterious SNPs, right? So they are inherited Mendelian genetic disorders. Most of these deleterious variations affect the functions of the protein. And sickle cell anemia, we're going to talk about this, why it is all, at the end of the day, it is all answers to everything is actually in the three-dimensional structure of proteins, which is what we're going to be talking about tomorrow. See, for example, in sickle cell anemia, there's only one mutation, right? From a glutamic acid to a valine. So it is in this position and look at the changes in the structure with just one position. This is just visual. You can just see how the helices are rearranging and completely things look very different, right? So just one mutation, can actually cause a large change in the three-dimensional mm -hmm. structure. And three-dimensional structures is very integral to understanding functions. Without structures, you can't understand functions, right? So now what has happened with all of these SNPs is people started creating sequence of genomes of large populations and they're comparing all of these. So all the people who have similar SNPs could actually be the same. All the people who have different SNPs can. There are so many examples of how a SNP actually can actually work as a biomarker in one population. As a, in one population, it may cause, uh, it may be detrimental in another population. It may actually be protective in another population. It may actually, that SNP may not even affect that population. So we are learning a lot about this. So like your Facebook profiles that each one of you actually probably have. So we can actually cre create profiles by grouping people with similar things, right? And then this is actually very easily, it can easily be used for diagnosis purposes, right? So e genome of each individual contains the SNP, SNP pattern. People can be grouped based on SNP profiles. And SNP profiles is very, very important in identifying responses to drug therapy. For example, one example is albitrol is an inhaler that is given for people with asthma. So depending on what polymorphism people have, albitrol may actually work for that, people, that person for asthma or may not actually work. So people are actually looking at the SNP profiles right now to figure out which drug will work, which drug may not work. And so this is actually a very, very powerful tool that we're all actually looking into. And there are lots of correlations that will emerge. Do we know about everything? Probably not, but we are, we are getting there. We are actually learning more. At least we know that it's actually very, very important. And one case study that's actually being used, and I know it is actually being used, at least in Canada and in some clinics, 
uh, where they test for warfarin, right? Warfarin is, you know, it is the most widely prescribed anticoagulating that is, that is, it is used for preventing thrombolytic clots, blood clots. So anyone who is in a hospital going through surgeries, actually, they're given just to avoid that they actually develop blood clots, right? So it's actually very important. So actually, if you don't give the right dosage of a drug, it actually can impact you in many different ways, which is what we're finding. And you have to look into the, you know, ethnic, it's where they are, uh, where they belong, and what is their age and everything else, right? Second most important, and it's also, it can it is implicate an adverse drug reaction as well, right? So personalized warfare indocent people have found, we, this is actually being used right now. This is an example that is actually being used. So they found um, SNPs that actually define what dosage to give someone, and they found SNPs to figure out whether even warfare is even going to work in this part. Uh, work in that particular patient. I know for a uh, for a fact that Asians, at least people of Indian origin, um, actually need much much less dosage of this, and so you have to be very careful. And so physicians, even if they're if they're all in clinical trials right now, and some uh, some clinics already actually use it in Canada. I know that for a fact, right? So so you actually SNPs are very important. So uh, we have identified a lot of different SNPs, right? So there are lots of different SNPs that have been identified. And in fact, there is a SNPedia that has been created. You can actually go and look at SNPedia to figure out which polymorphism is actually working in something. And statins, for example, it's given and all of those things, right? Tamoxifen and all of those different things. This is just an example to show you how important this is. Now, this whole project, HapMap, has led to another whole field of pharmacogenomics or the other term that is constantly being used is personalized medicine. And I'm sure you've all heard, right? One size does not fit all, right? One size does not fit all. So what works in one person does not work. It's not surprising. And so this, all this work on HapMap actually led to whole gene, a whole field of pharmacogenomics. How you use individuals' genetic profile to predict responses to certain drugs, and clinical goal is to enable drug treatment decisions and genetic tests are already available in use for some of these diseases. Pharmacogenomics has actually the potential to revolutionize how drugs are being developed and prescribed. And of course, a big part of it is also how do we do drug repurposing, right? When, when one size does not fit all. Anyway, that's a topic for another day. <coughs> and of course, <coughs> excuse me. And also, the last project, of course, I'm going to talk to you about is the ENCODE project, Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. So I think we discussed earlier, right, the 98.5% of our genome that used to be called junk DNA, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is in biochemistry textbook. If you're all familiar with biochemistry textbook, Leninger, if you look in maybe version edition, three and two and four, in fact. And when I studied biochemistry, all of this was actually called the junk DNA. We didn't, we didn't even care about it. All that we cared about is this 1.5% of the human genome that codes for just proteins, right? Coding region. But then once we didn't get answers from HapMap, right? HapMap answered a lot of questions, but also, you know what? It was not actually answering a lot of different questions that we had. So then we said, okay, you know what? Finally, we have to invest time in looking at this 98.5 percent. Maybe there is some clue there that is actually more important than we ever thought, right? So the ENCODE project, when it was completed, oh my God, you can imagine there were like 6,000 to 7,000 publications within a month. We couldn't even, I am still, you know, still reading, which was in 2013. What it said was it writes eulogy to junk DNA. So there is no more concept of junk DNA. People are going to be offended if you say, oh, it's junk. It's not junk. Quite honestly, this region of the genome is actually the one that is more important or equally important than all the coding. Because you know why? It actually carries the keys to regulation of these coding genes. So the, the non-coding region actually holds keys to the coding region. Can you believe that? So it has, they've identified a lot and lot of regulatory elements that regulate the functions of all of those genes that we thought was the most important. So which means, what does this tell you? This tells you that actually every part of your human genome is actually important. 
there is nothing in your genome that is actually not important. So which means even you guys will have a lifetime of work to do to uncover all of this. And I'm not sure what is coming next. Of course, there are lots of other projects coming next, but we still have a whole hands. And you can see the whole field of informatics. How has it exploded just in 15 years? And look at where we are today. So these are all, all of these things, right? So then the genome-wide association study, which is one of my favorite studies that I use it a lot is how the polymorphisms differ between different ethnic populations, right? How does this drug work in a European population? Why is it not working in Asian population, right? And why is all of these things, or uh, whatever it is, right? <clears throat> so um, I'm not sure if I should, um, um, uh, Bipsha, are you actually keeping track of the questions in the chat by any chance so that we can actually get back to answering those questions? Yes, Dr. Sona. Yeah, so then I can actually, Spend yeah. the last 10, 10 minutes maybe to just kind of, you know, summarize and answer all those questions. Sure. Uh, so that to, because, you know, um, since I lost time in the beginning, I just need to make sure I actually, or I am able to. And then um, I apologize to all of the, all of you people that, um, you know, your, uh, quest, your questions are coming in, but I'm going to answer, I'll answer those questions for sure, right? Just hold on to those questions. So genome-wide association studies, it actually enables a comparison of genetic variations between different ethnic populations, right? Now that is actually a big thing. And it, there is a catalog that we can just download to a computer and actually analyze that. That has actually come up with a, mapped a lot and lot of SNPs that differ between different populations actually. And then um, it is actually very good that you can actually, you know, compare those SNPs and figure out, oh my goodness, this SNP is, is found in European population, which means, you know what, this drug is not going to work. So it, this is actually going to help us a lot initially, it, but we are still trying to figure this out. You know why? Because majority of the SNPs that are coming out of genome-wide association studies are actually in the intronic region, in the non-coding region. So we are still trying to make sense of these SNPs, but there are lots of tools that have been developed and so, but this is still very useful. Right? There are still lots of SNPs that we are actually. So the benefits is it has actually expanded our understanding of diseases. It simplified the process of finding small variations and it has actually discovered numerous diseases, SNPs and also the genes, right? And will definitely help in connecting a lot of different dots for us, right? So genome-wide population, and I believe there are like about um, lots and lots of different studies that have come up. And uh, now there is genome-wide association studies with COVID patients. Um, and I just got a glimpse, a small little glimpse um, of what it's looking like. It's still not publicly available. And also you probably all heard also that some populations are affected more than others. Of course, we already know that people who have comorbidity um, conditions like hypertension and high cholesterol um, and all of those things are at a higher risk than you know, other people, right? So that we already know that uh, age is a factor of uh, people with comorbidities like hypertension and cholesterol, high cholesterol and, you know, cardiovascular diseases or anything else. If you have conditions, that means you're going to, you're more vulnerable and actually it is, uh, can be mortality is, could be higher in this population, right? Of course, we're also learning other things. And of course, one of the major factors, which is something that I am looking into is as well, one of the thing is that um, a lot of people, there is a, a, there is a problem with blood coagulation pathways. So you are, people are seeing a lot of clotting, even in young, younger people, even in people with, uh, who are in the 30s and you know, 30s and younger than 30s, uh, people are seeing a lot of different clotting and all of those things. But all of this is something that we are already, you know, we, are, we are seeing all of this, but yet there are some things that we are seeing, uh, at least in the US, I've not looked at other countries in detail, is there is a higher, um, you know, um, cases and higher mortality rates among African American population in, in the U.S. at least. So it is like, oh, why is that happening? Is because of course one is of course there a lot of them are frontline workers, essential workers, and all of those things. But in spite of that, they also are at a higher risk for high cholesterol and hypertension and cardiovascular diseases. But also there are some polymorphisms in some of your genes that I'm actually putting together. Of course, I can't present it yet because I'm just 
putting up the story, but I just want to drive mm -hmm. to you the fact that these genome-wide association studies are extremely remarkably useful for understanding the differences between different ethnic populations, right? Now, there are lots of 100K projects and all of those things, right? So now all the diseases in GWAS, of course, I've not updated, I have not updated this, but there are a lot more diseases. Like, there are like 15,000 diseases discussed right now, and there are like thousands of genes and thousands of SNPs that the genome-wide association studies have identified. In fact, there are some diseases where the clues for those diseases came from genome-wide association studies. For example, inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, for many decades, we were, uh, they were thinking of oh, there was only one polymorphism in one particular gene, not two. But then now we are learning that it's just not that. But we're also learning that this genome-wide association studies has actually uncovered a lot of loci in inflammatory bubble diseases. So there are a lot of diseases that actually uh, genome-wide association. So we are, as you can see, from where we started, from the Human Genome Project to HAPMA Project to ENCODE Project to genome-wide association studies, we've actually gathered a lot of data. And we actually have gathered a lot of knowledge from all of those things. Are we still there yet? But right now, there's too much data. We have not even looked at it to figure out whether we still need other things. There is one other thing that we are learning right now, which is the next phase and the next wave that I'm not going to be talking about, about that. You all know there is something that's missing from all my slides. There is one project that's actually become very integral right now. We are actually missing. Uh, I'm not talking about it, but it's actually very, very important. Is there, do you see anything that I'm missing? I'm not sure. Any guesses of some things that I'm actually missing? Maybe Ilya may be talking about it next week. Yeah, actually, yeah, there are lots of other genome projects. That is true, UK has a huge project. And even here, we are having a 1 million project. We're having lots of different sequencing projects. That is true. Um, yes, actually, um, it's a very good question. And I'm going to address uh, Mayuwa. I'm not sure if I'm saying you. Yeah, where, where did the term big data come from? Yes, I'm not actually sure if I can answer your question about um, in literature where the term. So there is this uh, thing called V4, velocity, veracity, and volume. Uh, and what is the other way? I'm missing out on the other way. So there are like four Vs they defined. One of the companies actually that says that this is actually V4, which is the volume based on volume, based on whatever it is. And I think, uh, yeah, variability. Thank you, Leah. So variability. So this V4 is the one that actually said, and I think, I don't even remember, I don't know if Ilya knows the answer to this question in terms of when did big, the term big camp come into the literature. So I think because everything was so big, I think people just started using big. I don't know exactly the answer, uh, but it's actually a fantastic question. I've never been asked this question. I don't know if Ilya, do you have an answer to that question? Where did the whole concept of who started using? I think it was one of these companies that actually, who defined a V4. But I can actually, um, uh, we will, oh, so Ilya is going to talk about it. And also I will actually, you know, that is my homework for me today. I will, I will see if I can find that answer and I'll share it with, the, with you all tomorrow. If you're gonna be there tomorrow, just ask me that question again, right? Okay, so what is missing in all of those is microbiome, right? Um, microbiome is the one that we are missing in this. And I think Ilya is gonna be talking about this. So that is another new phase that we're all in, that it's the microbes that actually control us, not all of these things, because we have more number of genes from the microbes than our own homo human gene, which means they're actually taking over all of this stuff, right? You would think that they, we have like more than three times more number of genes than, than we have. So, so this is all a summary of all of this data that we actually have. And then what is the future? As you can see, the future of genomics, which is already the future right now, is to go to a physician. What are they gonna do? They're gonna actually do all of this informatic analysis on you to figure out a pattern, right? Are we there yet today? I think the answer is yes. When I gave this talk 10 years ago, I said, we're not there yet. We will get there yet, get there. But in 10 years now, I'm looking back and I'm, yes, actually we are already there because of several of physicians 
actually do sequence sequencing. And that's why even all the COVID data is there for you to analyze next week. It's very exciting. We have lots of data from uh, patient samples. We have a lot of clinical data at NC, but we have a lot, a lot of sequencing data. And every, every single physician's office have, they all have sequencing data in their freezers for people like you who are going to train, get trained in bioinformatics, are going to be do, are going to have good jobs because we really need informaticians. We don't have that many informaticians to actually who know how to analyze these all of this data. And thanks to companies like uh, PyInvite, where they're creating platforms for us to make our life much easier to actually mine all of this data, create projects, and all of those things. Right. So this is going to be the future of all of these things because we know um, more specific information because of all of this, we can actually diagnose more precisely. In fact, there is a whole consortium of rare diseases, right? So people who have rare diseases who did not have a diagnosis 20 years ago, now they actually can have a diagnosis. And I know, a, personally, I know this person, a big scientist at NIH who's actually doing this project of diagnosing people who were who said that, oh, there is no diagnosis. We don't know what this is. I have no idea what this is. There is no diagnosis. Now we are able to, there's a whole rare disease consortium, right? Select specific treatment that best fits and also predict risks before the symptoms occur. You can actually manage diseases more effectively. And of course you can actually, you know what, target medication, specifically the whole concept of personalized medicine, provide earlier treatment, actually, you know, take preventive actions eliminate unnecessary treatments actually and you know provide better timings for all of those things and adjust treatments to uh, changes in all that so in this provide earlier treatment take preventive actions and actually even save healthcare dollars right and this one example i'm going to give you is i'm not sure how many of you actually have heard of the drug called tamoxifen which is something that i put it in my earlier slides as uh, something where we have the polymorphisms for have you all anyone know what tamoxifen is have you heard of the tamox drug tamoxifen Yes, I see yes, no, you no, know, a lot of no's, some is. Okay, so those of you actually say yes, can you tell me what, um, some of you say yes, so can you tell me what what it is, what, what the drug is used for? Um, cancer, that's correct. So the drug is used for cancer. Do you know which cancer? Breast cancer, absolutely correct. So it is used for breast cancer. And guess what? We all have to thank bioinformatics. You know why? Because uh, bioinformatics actually changed the way people are actually diagnosed. I mean, not the way people are diagnosed, but how they are actually a treatment protocol. Um, and actually these polymorphisms actually helped. So what this stomach, there are like 200 actually bioinformatics, thanks to bioinformatics, this is one of the early on um, contributions. Of course, there are lots of other contributions. So tamoxifen is a magic bullet that is given to people diagnosed with breast cancer, right? Meaning that once they're diagnosed with breast cancer, and if they are early stage breast cancer, they go through uh, maybe radiation therapy, they go through chemotherapy, and in fact, even later stages, once they go through their treatment protocol, some of them, if they are premenopausal, which means they are below 50 years of age or whatever, they are given this drug for five years. And this is supposed to prevent recurrence of their cancer, right? It's amazing, right? The drug has existed for 30, 40 years. It's really working like magic. Of course, you know what? Some people it works, some people it does not work, which we already talked about. But now there is a test to see whether this is gonna work or not and all of those things. But, and, but they have come up with a panel of 200 genes, and this is all came from informatics, bioinformatics. Now they have come up with a 22 panel gene, which is called oncotyping. So every patient is actually, they go through this testing, uh, oncotyping, they look at what are the genes that are expressed in their cancer, and they give a score between one to 30. And if the score is like less than seven, then you don't have to keep monitoring them every six months with a mammogram, with an ultrasound and all of those things, right? That saves them from radiation, that saves money as well. So now if you have a score of say 27, 28, then these patients are monitored very closely because the recurrence of this cancer is really high. 
And so then they are monitored. So you know what? So informatics has played a significant role in all of these things. And the other example is lymphomas, like leukemias, lymphomas. The classifications of lymphomas came from bioinformatics, again, from, you know, expression, microarray expression data analysis, right? So there are lots of different things that all of these omics have actually contributed to. So this is pretty much where, you know, all the contributions are. Now, of course, it looks like I, I do have enough time for questions and answers and discussions. Now, I would say this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. So if you keep reading it, your head is going to roll because you don't know if I am saying it is actually the beginning or I'm actually, I'm saying it's the end, but I think it's a beginning of, you know, it's actually the beginning of uh, something again. So because we have actually transformed all of this data analysis and all of those things, right? So now, um, if, of course, you know, I'm going to, um, you know, if you have computers, I don't know if you all actually have a computer, uh, then you actually can, I'm actually going to, um, we just can actually, I just want to show you this. Um, I'm just going to paste this into your chat box. So um, I really like this, and I think this is something that you can actually uh, look at. Um, and you actually just can actually take a walk. Um, Right? So this is actually something that I teach my, when I teach uh, high school students and everyone who is really new, I think this is actually very, very exciting, right? So you can actually, this tells you uh, for each chromosome, um, it tells you, you know, you can actually look at, for each chromosome, you can actually look at what are the polymorphisms that actually have um, been identified. This is actually probably not updated fully, but then at least, you know, this is actually a good start to understand the chromosomes and what are the polymorphisms and it actually tells you what diseases are actually caused for for example this particular position it's uh, this is particular gene and it actually tells you uh, what all of these different things are and so you can actually this it tells you that uh, this gene is actually involved in making the sperm and all of those things and then it can actually tell you that this gene is actually one that induces tissue repair and so, you know, there are lots of, um, so you can actually, I really like this because you can just play around with, um, you know, all of these different things and, uh, you know, learn about what are the different chromosomes that are actually uh, really, really important um, in, you know, different aspects of different things, right? So um, right now, what I will do is I will uh, wait uh, before if I want to, you know, I can add on more things to what I said, but let me first answer all of your questions because we just have 10 more minutes. I just want to answer your questions uh, so that I'm not talking into the last very minute. So I would really encourage any discussion points you have um, and we can actually talk. I know there were some questions that I did not answer along the way. So I am ready for your, let's have a discussion. If, and of course, I have some questions for you as well. So that can actually, you know. So um, did, did I miss any questions, uh, Bipsha? If you can actually um, tell me the questions that I missed and I can, we can actually discuss that. I see everything is covered right now. Okay, so, okay. So are there any, any more questions? Okay, are there any open sources to study omics? Okay, well, there are, uh, which is, uh, you know, you're going to learn a lot of um, omics resources uh, that we are going to cover. Um, as I told, I told you early on, uh, there is another website uh, called the Omics World, um, and that is actually going to give you practically thousands and thousands of tools and resources that you can each, you can do for each type of omics, right? Um, I can actually show you that at the very end when we actually summarize um, um, all of our you know, data for this week. Uh, but there are lots and lots of different omics. And I would recommend all of you to read the database article that I actually uh, sent that actually gives you uh, the list of recommended 
resources for each of the different things because those are actually someone has actually physically gone there and actually looked at each of the resources to make sure that the data there is actually reliable because you know what we can spend a lot of time doing experimentation on something that actually may not even be reliable right you can spend the whole so i would recommend you go and look at that article that and follow all the list of resources that's there in that article i would highly recommend that and rather than being a part of any organization on yours like i am not a student of now uh, how do i do it privately um you mean you want to privately in terms of learning the resources uh, parimala is that your question basic informative session so uh, let me see how do okay um yeah so you can actually i think you can uh, register to pine biotech without any uh, you don't have to be affiliated to any university or uh, institution i don't know if that's what you're asking um and how do snips and introns influence drug effectiveness so that's actually um a very good question superna the, how do snips and so so right now it is actually a gray zone because as you know that it is hard to figure out the effect of a snip directly but what we are actually doing is the implying mode right so this snip is probably what we do is we actually find the gene it's closest to on either side upstream or downstream genes or set of genes that this actually this snip is actually very very close to and then we figure out whether there is any regulatory mechanisms from these genes that is very close to this particular snip and also the other way that i personally use in my research is i look at microRNAs as well and so those are the different aspects that we actually um look at to figure out how do we actually look at the effect of snips yeah please actually you know um put your questions to everyone maybe okay so is there any other questions that i missed uh learning exploring and learning yeah so i think there are lots of different resources uh for learning i think i would start with that paper and go through resources but i would actually talk i would actually start with all the courses offered in pine biotech because um this those uh, courses are phenomenal uh, in fact introductory bioinformatics and everything are phenomenal because you can take it at your own pace and learn all the tools and i think what i like about it is actually every tool i also explains why you're using the tool where it's coming from so if you're doing self study i would actually start with a reliable resource and i think i've tested and i've used pine biotech i that's what my students use as well so i would actually just um start there and if you want to do advanced um things that if there is something that's not there then of course uh, you can email either ilia or myself and maybe we can um direct you to some things and maybe at the end whenever you're done sona we can do yeah. a little bit overview of the specific courses and we have a blog post that we did just to help you set up primal uh, yeah yeah any question so i'll just i can show you after you're done yeah sure okay so um okay there are other messages okay um exploring portal okay for the bank might do they usually use non coding servers uh, to analyze data so um when you say non coding servers jeffrey i'm not sure what you mean by non coding servers uh, but if you're talking about cloud space and if uh, that is uh, something is that what you're asking for data analysis um so at jachtan we do have um you know we have data space in the cloud um and for me i have um my own server um and so and then our university information systems here at jachtan has many servers that we actually can use um i don't know if that is actually um that is actually your question um i think okay. uh, you're referring uh, to the comment that i uh, made about the t by info server because you yeah. know the students they don't need to learn coding to use it we upload the oh. data to the cloud and we focus more on analysis i think elia is going to give us like a walk through so that it's easier for everyone to understand how it works and it can definitely be used for research because researchers are using it all the time 
because what you are actually doing at the end of the day is analysis, which is more important. So I think uh, Elia can cover that up. Yeah, so, um, uh, so I think there's a question about uh, for a, a book on pharma pharmacogenetic and pharmacogenomics. I actually have an outstanding book that I actually use for my teaching purposes of pharmacogenomics, and I don't have it with me at this moment in time. It's in my shelf in the other room, uh, but I will be sure to pass that on to you tomorrow. Please ask, if you're there tomorrow, I'm not sure if you're coming tomorrow, but if you are, please ask me that question again. And I will uh, make sure that I get the book that I use, personally use for that purpose. Okay, Ilya, you wanted a few minutes to show something. I guess maybe you can. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, this was a very insightful presentation. Can I uh, share my screen now? I think yes, yes. Okay, so I will um, share with you guys. So those of you are coming tomorrow, I will definitely share. Yeah, yeah, so the okay, so um, I wanted to make sure that everyone also understands where to find some of these resources that we have been mentioning. As I mentioned in the very beginning of the session, after you register and complete your registration, you become a part of this program and you have a dedicated page here where you will have access to a forum, which is private to the participants of this program. We will post here the recordings of these sessions, uh, answer any technical problems that you face uh, doing the assignments or downloading things and, and things like that. We'll post your practice data sets uh, that we will use in the sessions. Any questions that we don't uh, have time to cover in the online session like today, you can continue putting them right here. Highlight top performers, so people that are very active and do a lot of uh, you know, projects and, and work on the coursework, we will post them here. Uh, and any other topics that you will find here, so we will just continuously expand this. There is a uh, post, if you look in chat, uh, we just have a uh, blog post about how to um, set up the um, how to set up Pymol. So, Bipsa, if you could put that there as well, and that will give you an example of. Um, okay, there we go. So that that's an example of how you can find, for example, uh, you know, a short tutorial uh, and follow it after the session. So in this first week, especially, we will rely on PyMol. And uh, here you will see ICN3D and PyMol, just instructions on how to register and download. Um, and you'll see some of the useful links here as well about PyMol, if you're just getting started. And then ICN3D, so Mohit Mazumdar, uh, who also has a PhD in computational biology, put together this short tutorial. And as we go through some of these other tools, you'll see a lot more reference material here as well. Also, as you uh, saw, uh, Sona uh, Vasudevan mentioned a number of different resources that you can uh, look into, NCBI, um, you know, and all of these different repositories where you have either data or you have some tools to explore that data. So if we focus on a specific um, section like that, we'll also post a little tutorial here that you can follow to navigate and explore what's in there. So the other resource that we keep mentioning is this uh, platform. So I just briefly wanted to show you what we are talking about so that you understand the level of complexity that you should be ready for. It is a tool used by researchers and we offer it as a research solution. However, we use it a lot for education, even starting at the uh, high school level. And I'll give you an example. So you mentioned all transcriptomics as one of the type of omic data. And uh, to process transcriptomic data from next generation sequencing, it requires a number of different steps to really put together a table of gene expression. So just as an example, you can see here a, a pipeline builder. This is using a demo data set, but the explanation of how to build this pipeline is very simple for you to follow. So you don't need any coding. You don't need to set up any resources on your own computer. It's a cloud-based cloud system. Once you start, 
you will be guided. And so you will have only limited number of selection where you can select, for example, to do pre-processing. If you do pre-processing, then you will see that your next selection is changing based on the previous selection that you did. And building a pipeline is very simple. Of course, it is, uh, you know, more in-depth explanations are given inside. And we even have courses specifically explaining each one of these steps, why you do it, what type of data do you need to do it, and what will be the outcomes. So the outcomes are going to be using some example data sets that you can actually download and check. Some of these methods, especially the ones designed around uh, specific types of downstream analysis steps, will provide you with an R script that you can download. So a lot of times, for example, here you can see I did principal component analysis and I can download an R script. We have an additional playground for coding for those of you that are interested in coding. And this is also something that you will get access to if you are participating in this program. So some of these methods, this is more a little bit for the second part of the program, but you'll see that the exact same method that is described there will provide you with a tutorial where you can learn the code. And after you learn the code, you can try that code, modifying it to see how it works. So just an explanation that this resource, sorry, this centralized resource will uh, show you how you can attend the sessions. So we will be emailing you the Zoom links, but you can see all of the sessions and the upcoming session will be highlighted here. You will get additional resources and all of your questions answered on forum. Here you will find the coursework that is associated with this program specifically. And in the coursework, again, for completing each one of these courses, you get a separate certificate that is besides the program certificate. This is just for completing the independent work that you do in these courses. A lot of the coursework utilizes some element like the platform that I just showed you over here. And as you can see, the platform covers a number of these different types of omics data. So we'll talk about some of these types of data, including finding those SNPs and analyzing gene expression and also looking at microbiome data that we can analyze for diversity of uh, different microbes. So again, if you are already a member, then you can start navigating some of these resources. If you're not a member yet, you can still complete your registration today. Um, and you will be able to access a lot of these materials as soon as you complete your registration. Okay, are there any questions about any of yeah, this? If I may add something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, there is a question that I got from Parimala, and I think it might uh, be a question for everybody else, uh, which is the login to tbioinfo. So you have two separate accounts. One is the Science Coach website where you have already registered. And the other is the tbioinfo. I have emailed everybody except for save Amy. So you all should have that access right now. Please use that email and username and password to log into tbioinfo. And this is separate. But in your activity, you will be able to keep track of both of them. Uh, Elia, could you show like how the activity is tracked, where they can see, uh, I mean, the pipelines they are running? Yeah. So uh, typically, as you can see, you will see your um, account right here. And under your profile, you will see all of the activity that is related to whatever course or pipeline that you are running. Um, so here you can see uh, my activity. You can see that I finish a pipeline um, or that I start a pipeline. And for others, you will see that you can complete a specific activity in coding, or you can also see an activity related to coursework that you complete. So you'll see the stream and then also your points will accumulate right here. So if you look at your overall point progress, this is a metric that we use to make sure that we uh, understand uh, your activity, understand the number of courses that you are completing or the pipelines that you are running um, and can address 
specific types of questions that you might have to do any type of a pipeline. Because if you run a pipeline and something doesn't work, we can directly go into that pipeline, see your uploaded data, see the settings that you've done. And if there's some mistake, we can either correct it or inform you about how to correct it on your own. All right, well, I don't see any more questions and we're already running a little bit over time. So I think we had a great presentation today from Dr. Sona Rasudavan, thank you very much. For those of you coming tomorrow, we will meet at the same time. You will receive an email with your Zoom link to access tomorrow's session. And again, thank you for joining today. We're looking forward to continuing this program with all of you. Thank you all. It was uh, an amazing batch for me. Uh, I love interaction and you guys were very interactive and I just love that. And uh, let's keep it going. Uh, hopefully you learned something today. And, uh, you know, if there are any more questions that you can think of, uh, you know, uh, please uh, bring it tomorrow to class and we can actually discuss anything you may have. The goal is, for example, that you need to, you know, get something out. So we're all here to help. Have a great day, everyone. I know some of you, it's a, it's a nighttime and some of you, you know, all those time zones. Thank you for making the time. And uh, thank you, Ilya. And thank you, Bipsha and Mohit. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sona and Ilya.